Craig, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for doing this again. Um, very interested to know what's been going on with Lions Trust since we last talked to you. Um, but I'll give you a chance, as um, usual, just to introduce the fund and tell us a bit about what you're trying to do, please. Yeah, no problem, James. And thanks for the opportunity to, to talk through it. We actually um, had the uh, annual general meeting uh, of Alliance Trust uh, just the other day. And so uh, just got back from that. And there's been a lot of positivity from shareholders on, on the back of that. So I thought I'd share um, some of the things that we talked about uh, in that presentation, but, but also um, great opportunity to go through lots of questions around the trust. Um, but yeah, probably the first place to start is just uh, um, set out what the objective of the trust is, uh, and that's set out on here. But ultimately, it's all about long-term patient investing. We're looking to deliver um, strong long-term returns through a combination of both capital growth and, importantly, uh, a rising dividend. And um, indeed, we've managed to do that for 56 years in a row now of increasing dividends. We are a dividend hero under the AIC. Uh, which is anyone with more than 20 years of increasing dividends every year. Of that elite group of trusts that have been doing this for more than 20 years, uh, we've actually had the strongest dividend growth over the last five years of all of them. So um, that's an important part of it, but ultimately it's around getting good long-term uh, returns. And we're confident that if we do that, um, then we'll significantly outperform both the benchmark, which is the MSCI All Country World Index, uh, and the peer group, uh, over the long term, as we've done so far, and, and we'll talk through as we go through. So a reminder of how we actually deliver that objective. Uh, ultimately, it is a multi-manager approach. So uh, that came in place uh, on the 1st of April 2017, so six years ago, and we'll, we'll talk through how things have gone since that point. But essentially, um, our job is to pick what we think uh, are the world's best stock pickers. So that's us at uh, WTW, Willis Towers Watson, um, we pick who we think are the best top pickers in the world and then manage a portfolio, uh, putting those managers together and ultimately choosing managers that are, are quite different. Again, I'll, I'll go through that. Um, what we think this brings is, is these six things put up here. So first of all, diversification. I mean, the big advantage uh, of this multi-manager approach here is that you're not beholden to the skill of one individual or indeed one asset management firm, but perhaps even more importantly, you're not beholden to the style uh, of any one particular approach. And so there's no reason why it has to do particularly um, poorly in specific market environments. We've got a, a, an approach that can work in any market environment. So that's the, the principle there on diversification. But importantly, we do that slightly differently to other multi-manager uh, approaches in that uh, it's very high conviction. So we ask each of the uh, stock pickers that we've got in place to just run their very best ideas in a portfolio. So these are um, segregated accounts run specifically for Alliance Trust, and they have a maximum of 20 stocks that they're allowed to own. Um, so just give us their very best ideas and we'll worry about risk control in terms of how we blend those managers. Um, you know, they should think about risk more in terms of permanent loss of capital in the companies that they're uh, investing in. So that allows us to produce significant outperformance despite the advantages of all that diversification that I alluded to. And importantly, we can do that uh, with competitive costs. Uh, and so because Willis Towers Watson um, advise on a few trillion dollars of institutional capital, we have a, a, a relatively unique situation of very, very strong um, buying power with the asset management community. And we've been able to keep the OCR on this um, below that of many single manager approaches, let alone uh, all the multi-manager approaches that are out there that are much more expensive. And so that's a, a key advantage uh, of this approach. Uh, and we've been able to um, bring exclusive access to managers that aren't typically available uh, in UK retail space, or if they are, um, you certainly wouldn't be able to get access to their best ideas 20 stock portfolio. But I'll talk through some of the managers uh, uh, in a moment uh, to give um, or bring that to life, essentially. Now, we do all of that through a sustainability lens. To be clear, this isn't an ESG or sustainability or impact fund per se. Everything's around um, uh, uh, getting the best long-term returns 
over the long term. But ultimately, we think being strong in sustainability allows you to get better returns at lower risk. And so it's a big part of what we do. It's embedded in everything. Um, we'll only pick managers that we think are strong on the sustainability side. Um, and uh, we also do a lot uh, on the engagement and stewardship side, uh, both in terms of uh, encouraging the managers to vote uh, on everything, but also we employ EOS at Federated Hermes uh, on top of all of this to do engagement on our behalf with the underlying companies. And they're, they're one of the world's largest uh, and best renowned um, engagement overlay specialists. And then finally, we do all that with this backdrop of increasing dividends uh, every year. As I say, we're not going to break that streak of 56 years. So that's that's the, the summary of, of what we do. Perhaps if we dive into the next slide, what we've got there is the current manager lineup. And actually, this manager lineup hasn't changed in the last 12 months. Um, the last change we had in a manager was back in the first quarter of, of 2022. So this is the lineup. Um, there's a few things I'd, I'd bring to light here. Um, firstly, that point that these aren't just all names that are, are well known in UK retail space. Um, some of that is because a number of them are not based in the UK. And indeed, um, uh, it takes some work to find some of these organisations. So Black Creek at the top there are in Toronto and Vulcan Value uh, and top left uh, next to them uh, are in Birmingham, Alabama. And so these aren't well-known uh, names, some of these. And even the ones that are well-known, as I said, um, you wouldn't be able to get access to their 20-stop best ideas portfolio anyway, other than through um, this approach. Now, you'll see there we've got different weightings to each of the managers. Uh, one thing I would point out is GQG have two slices of the pie there. So whereas everyone in this lineup runs a 20 stock best ideas portfolio, GQG are the exception that they also run um, an emerging market portfolio for us. That's the 6% slice there. But all the others are a 20 stock best ideas uh, portfolio. The second point I'd make is that each of these managers are very, very different. Um, and so, um, you know, that's not just that some are more value oriented than, than others and some are more growth oriented. Um, it's also that, you know, even within the value space or the growth space, they're very different in how they um, uh, come at the, the problem. So, um, you know, Lyrical as an example of a, a value manager, um, they will start with um, all of the uh, US um, large and mid cap companies, and they will say, what are the cheapest quintile of stocks? So the bottom 20% in terms of valuation, and then really dig into which of those companies uh, are not cheap for a reason. Um, they are companies that are very strong, producing good earnings, are going to continue to produce good earnings, uh, and actually you're just buying them at an incredible bargain. Um, that's their kind of approach, whereas someone like a Vulcan value um, that will um, refer to themselves as a value manager will actually be starting quite differently with what are the great companies that you'd want to earn own for the very long term and then which of those um, can you find at very discounted prices and that's often not going to be the case and so they'll typically run very concentrated portfolios 10 15 stocks um, for us uh, with that maximum of 20 but they tend to be at the lower end of that because they're not often finding those so they're both value managers but you would never get uh, overlap in the kind of stocks that they're owning as an example. So just thought I'd bring that point out. And then the weightings really are a function of two things. Firstly, um, the unique risk characteristics of each individual manager. Some are running higher risk portfolio than others. They might go down the, the cap spectrum, for example, more into mid and small cap, whereas others uh, are more um, in the large cap space. Um, or they might um, be looking for very out of favor situations rather than quality uh, growth companies. Uh, and so we take that into account in their weighting. And then also um, the main thing is how they all blend together at that particular point in time. And ultimately what we're trying to achieve here is to ensure that stock selection drives everything. And so if we flip to the next slide, we bring that out a little bit on the point that what we try and do 
is keep some of the big macro factors to a minimum so that that stock selection does come through as the key driver. And so here we've got the um, the actual weights on the, the left hand side for the sector and, and geography uh, of the portfolio and then how that looks in, in the chart relative to the benchmark, which is the MSCI uh, all country world index, as I mentioned before. And the, the key point here is they are very small positions at a sector level. Um, yet that you know most of them are in the one uh, percent or less uh, situation, some of them two, three percent, but those are quite small positions at a sector level. It's much more around the stocks that they're buying within the sectors. Similarly, on the right hand side, you don't get very big country positions. That said, at the moment, there is a significant underweight to the US, um, partly because the, the benchmark has got up to 60% plus uh, in the US, uh, and um, partly because the, the stock pickers are just finding uh, a lot of good opportunities outside of the US uh, today, rather unsurprisingly, given that the US stock market has been one of the best performers over quite a few years. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly on this chart, no real style biases. Those are very small positions. They're only really particularly big if they're getting to sort of plus or minus one. Um, the biggest of the lot is the one that we'll typically structurally have, which is a slight underweight to large and mega cap stocks and a slight overweight uh, to mid cap in particular. Um, and that's, you know, a function of if you're telling people to run their very best 20 stop ideas, it's unlikely that on average, they'll always be in the largest, most highly covered um, stocks that have by definition gone up the most to become the largest market cap. So that is a, a bit of a structural bias. Um, and that has been a, a big headwind uh, actually for the last uh, five years or so where large cap has driven everything or mega cap in particular. Um, but other than that, the quality growth value momentum, they'll move around, but in very, very small positions, uh, we're pretty much always uh, style neutral. So that's kind of the backdrop as to how we do it. Obvious question is, well, how's it gone? So as I said, we started managing this portfolio in this structure on the 1st of April, 2017. So it's been around six years. Obviously the trust itself has been around well over a hundred years, but in terms of it, the, the, the current approach to the multi-manager, um, it's from that 1st of April, 2017. And that's the uh, piece on the right-hand side. So over that full six year period, um, total shareholder return, and NAV total return are there. That total shareholder return represents a cumulative return of 60% over those six years. So a good outcome, you know, if we go back to that objective of producing real returns over the long term, um, we've certainly done that. Uh, and uh, with a rising dividend, well, uh, as I said before, um, dividend increases have been very significant, up 26% uh, last year versus the year before, uh, and the highest uh, of all the dividend heroes uh, over the last five years. Perhaps the period I, I would pull out um, is the last three years, um, not because uh, they're the biggest numbers. Um, yes, uh, outperformance of 17% per annum over those three years, but, but it's actually quite an interesting period, the three years to the end of March 2023, because it's from the bottom uh, of the equity fall post-COVID. So that was literally uh, March uh, 2020 um, that the that was at the bottom. And so that's an interesting period through there. And you've seen uh, that, um, that return of 17% per annum over that period. At the bottom, what we've got is over each of the periods, how we've performed in NAV terms versus the three obvious um, comparators. So the index benchmark that we've been set, the MSCI All Country World Index, which by the way has been one of the best performing uh, portfolios out there. This, um, you know, this has been a really tough period for active management, uh, given that um, the, the market's been led by a small number of very large growth companies, notwithstanding 2022. If you take that whole six year period, that's certainly been the case. Um, and then the other two being the peer groups. So the, the middle one there, the investment trust peer group, that's the other global equity um, uh, investment trusts that are out there. So it's the AIC global sector uh, average. And then the wider peer groups, that's the wider Morningstar one that includes all of the open-ended 
global equity retail funds as well as the investment trust. And you can see over all of those periods against all three comparators, we've done very well, in particular over the more recent periods, three years, uh, 2022 in particular, and uh, year to date, but significant outperformance of the peer groups, four or 5% per annum, depending on which one you take over that three years, uh, and almost 2% per annum relative to the benchmark, despite that performing uh, pretty well over that period. So very encouraging uh, performance, I would say, and, and certainly uh, shareholders seem to be very happy with um, the approach that's been in place for the last six years. Um, uh, uh, and we were getting that feedback at the AGM. Now, one of the things that we like to do is try and pull out, well, what's actually led to that performance? Because that might give you a better feel for what you can expect going forward from here. And so the way I tend to talk about this is that if you invest in uh, a public uh, equity company, there's, there's kind of two ways you can make money. So the first is what we call fundamental growth. That's this um, uh, fluorescent purple color uh, piece of this. And that's effectively if you bought the entirety of the company. So if you took it private, bought the entire company um, and held it forever, you would just get given um, the earnings that that uh, companies producing the dividends it's paying, but it would all go to you. And over the long term, that is what you would get back for the price you paid to buy that buy that company. And that um, purple piece is all about how have um, the earnings and dividends been progressing in the companies uh, that we've been owning uh, compared to expectations, compared to the market, all of those things. The second way you can make money, which is the, the, the more brownie type color there, is that whilst you're owning this entirety of the company, Mr. Market is offering to pay you different amounts depending on how the market feels, the sentiment about that particular company. And that's typically driven by more short-term things like current interest rates and hence what price earnings multiple they're willing to put on that particular company at that particular point in time. And so that's the multiple expansion piece of things. And so we try and break down how much of our returns have come from each of those and how much the returns from um, the index have come from those. And what you'll see is that a much higher proportion of our returns have come from fundamental growth than has been the case for the index. Now, you might then say, well, so what? And the so what is on the right-hand side there in that over the very long term, it's only really the purple that matters. Multiple expansion and contraction in companies um, happens through time. And in the short term, it will bounce around that your paper profits or outperformance of an index. Um, but over the long term, ultimately, if you pick great companies um, that um, beat expectations on their earnings, um, that will come through in the share price. And so this leads us to believe that there's actually quite a lot of latent value in the portfolio. And if we flip on to the next slide, we just remove those brown bits, just keep the purple bits to make it clearer. And what it shows is that, you know, if you just took that over that full six year period, we would have outperformed just on that fundamental growth piece by 1.8% per annum. Um, and on the right hand side, we've got over the last three years, we'd have outperformed by 6.8% per annum. So that's why we sit here pretty excited about our view that um, yes, we've started to see some very strong outperformance in the last uh, year or two, but actually we think there's potentially quite a lot to come because the stock pickers do seem to have been doing what we'd expect of them, taking a long-term view, finding companies that are um, producing um, more than was expected and the market was anticipating, and some of that has come through in share price uh, improvement but some of it hasn't. And we were talking to a number of the managers just this week where they were giving examples of companies that have beaten expectations on earnings, significantly beaten even their own expectations of when they got into the stock. And yet in some cases, the share price has almost halved just because of a short-term view on interest rates. Uh, but the manager hasn't changed what they're doing. They've continued to own those companies throughout. So that's um, some of the backdrop as to why we're excited. Maybe um, to put this in context, though, whilst we've got a very um, uh, 
positive view from a bottom up perspective on the companies we're owning, um, you know, we have to recognize in the short term, there are always this Mr. Market piece, this um, short term fluctuations in macro events that provide some risks to short term performance. Uh, and um, we look at that and we see that, you know, currently bond markets seem to be signaling signaling that a recession is likely to take place, whilst equity markets are generally not saying that's going to be the case. Maybe a little bit of tail off in earnings, but not a recessionary scenario. And so we've got a little bit of caution uh, about the market as a whole, and hence uh, our current gearing levels are a little bit below that um, typical strategic position of of 10%. We're still constructive. We've got um, we've got gearing in the portfolio, but less than we might have on average through time, given that caution. But we do think volatility creates opportunity for, for those stock pickers that know where to look. And on the next slide, uh, we just point out that um, one of the reasons we've got some confidence that um, things are starting to price in fundamentals rather than just big macro events are that you're starting to see more dispersion in stock returns and in sector returns. We've got the sector one on here as an example, but we think that's going to continue to be the case through time. Uh, and clearly there are lots of companies that have done really well in an era of free money um, with very low interest rates and no recession. Um, it will be interesting to see uh, what happens if we go to the next slide as that era of um, free money comes to an end, uh, it's going to be much more around uh, the strength of um, uh, companies. Uh, and given that uh, latent value we talked about on the fundamentals, we think that could be an interesting time. So final slide before I just hand over to you, James, is just, you know, how does the portfolio look given all of that backdrop? Well, we think we've got something that looks particularly attractive, both on a valuation perspective, it looks uh, cheaper uh, than the benchmark, uh, but also at the same time as having uh, higher and more stable earnings growth in the portfolio. And you don't often get the opportunity over a diversified portfolio to be able to do both of those things. And it's for some of the reasons that I've talked about that we don't think um, fundamentals have been fully priced into markets just yet. A lot of macro events have been driving markets. And so we sit here today pretty excited about the future. Great. That's very interesting. Thank you very much for that, Craig. Um, lots of questions coming in. So I was trying to sort of um, put these in its own order. Um, a few just about the sort of market cap positioning. So um, have you any idea what your sort of, how much you're underweight the big mega cap stocks? Yeah, so it's, um... It's not actually that significant. The, the interesting thing has been, you know, we don't run big positions in any of these macro things. And so we try and keep that relatively um, uh, similar to benchmark. But it's the one where we'll always be a little bit underweight. And so if you take um, the, the biggest companies uh, in the market, yes, we've got um, uh, we're very significantly underweight. Apple, for example, the biggest company in the benchmark, but we do own Microsoft and we do own Alphabet, for example, so we're overweight uh, Alphabet uh, in particular. So we do own some of those large companies. We are a few percent underweight uh, large cap. Now, normally that doesn't make a huge amount of difference. I mean, over the long term, actually having a slight bias towards um, mid cap and the lower end of large cap and um, slight underweight to mega cap. Um, would lead to long-term outperformance. But, um, but actually, there's been such an extreme difference over the last few years, you know, apart from 2022, um, where actually large cap still outperforms, which surprises people, but not by as much as it had in the previous years. That has been a significant headwind. So it's made a much bigger difference in, in performance outcomes. For example, just not owning Apple and Tesla for us has made a difference of 1% per annum for that six years. So 1% per annum just from not owning two stocks out of a few thousand in the universe. That's crazy, isn't it, really? Um, the, the slight sort of large cap underweight, is that all in mid cap, do you think? Or have you actually got a sort of small cap overweight? Um, so um, 
remember, this is against an MSCI all country world index. And so, you know, the definition of small cap in that index would be more like um, mid cap if you were thinking about it in UK terms. So we don't own, you know, if you were thinking about a single country portfolio and looking at small cap in that space, that um, not that many of those stocks are in the all country world index when you're looking on a global basis. So um, it's, it's definitely mid cap in the context of a, a world benchmark, but, um, but you, you it, uh, down to small cap in that context, but that would certainly be mid cap in a, a in a in a UK context if you take that example. Do you have? I mean, I know some some managers can buy the same stocks. It just sort of have overlaps in what they do. Do you actually have any kind of position size controls? So um, they've pretty much got um, freedom to uh, invest. Um, uh, up to um, what they want to invest in. Now, the managers will typically be running 20 stock portfolios. So in most cases, they start with a kind of mindset of equally weighting them. So most stocks would come in at you know, about a 5% position. They might run it up to about 10% of their portfolio. Obviously, we've got going on 10 managers. So you know that might, um, if you think about it that way. So you could, in theory, have all of the managers liking the same stock at exactly the same time. Um, and that would probably mean you'd end up with about 5% of your portfolio in that stock. Actually, is 5% in one stock a lot? You get that in most single manager approaches, right? Now, the reality is it's never happened in history that all the managers uh, like the same stock. Um, we have got a couple of stocks where five managers own it out of the nine um, but um, majority you know if you just take the the top 10 I think um, five of those are owned by one company uh, by one manager uh, but you have got two stocks Visa and Alphabet that are owned by five managers and then two stocks HDFC Bank and uh, MasterCard that are owned by three managers and then the rest are owned by one or at most two Okay, that makes sense. Um, that's an interesting question. Do you think the portfolio is actually works out to be lower risk than the normal than the index? So, so first thing to say is that you know, being an investment trust, it does have a little bit of gearing in it. So, um, you know, most investment trusts will look a bit like the index or slightly above in in volatility absent um, how they then construct the portfolio relative to that. Um, this is a pretty diversified, more equally weighted benchmark uh, index than the benchmark, which becomes a bit more skewed. So over the long term, yes, it is possible this would be slightly um, lower volatility, the index, but we would tend to think of it as pretty similar volatility to the index. Okay. Um, the UK overweight, um... Is that, is that through manager selection or does that a reflection of you think that the UK market is cheap? Yeah, is so, um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, this is a, a you know, we, we haven't chosen any UK equity managers, just to be clear. So uh, Jupiter is in here and people might think of Jupiter as, uh, you know, Ben Whitmore is, is the portfolio manager here. People might think of that as a UK manager. Actually, he runs a global portfolio for us. So it, it, it isn't a UK portfolio. So we haven't hired any UK equity specialists in here. Um, that said, we have got a few managers in the lineup that are finding more value in the UK um, than, um, than in some other countries. And so we've ended up from a bottom up perspective being overweight UK as it stands today. Okay. Um, how did you end up sort of picking the selection of managers? Well, how did you go, go about sort of choosing new ones? Yeah. So the backdrop here is that, you know, at WTW, we've got a, a very large um, manager research team. So um, 
we have a, a team of 60 or 70 people that just go out researching investment managers across all asset classes all around the world. And we've got researchers located in all the major financial centers going out and, and researching those managers. Uh, and within the equity team, there's 20 or 30 people just going out and researching uh, equity managers. So from that, and we've been doing that for, for decades, um, we cover um, a few thousand uh, equity managers um, uh, in some detail. Um, from that, we identify who we think are the most skilled managers. And then from that, um, we then identify, well, of those, which ones do we think are most skilled at running um, high conviction 20 stop portfolios? And there's a different skill set in managing a portfolio where you're thinking about risk more in terms of long term permanent loss of capital rather than short term tracking error to a benchmark or a peer group. Um, and so we then come up with a number of managers that we're comfortable could fit um, that kind of mandate. And we run other portfolios in a similar fashion to what we run for Alliance Trust in institutional space. And across that, we'll come up with 20 or 30 managers that we think we could easily put in the Alliance Trust portfolio. And then from that group, we then say, well, which ones blend together the best such that stock selection ultimately ends up driving everything. And that's how we came up with the original lineup for the Alliance Trust portfolio when we started six years ago. Then every day we come into the office and we say, well, is that still the best manager lineup that we could have in place for Alliance Trust? And so what would change our view on uh, whether we um, want to change any of those managers? So firstly, you know, the most obvious is that something changes dramatically at the manager and we've no longer got the same conviction that managers we used to have. To be clear, that isn't that they've underperformed. In fact, if anything, if nothing has changed at a manager, we still think they're skilled and they've underperformed, we'd be giving them more capital um, because it probably means it's a, a good time to invest with them because their style uh, has been cyclically out of favour. Um, so it's not that, it's normally something like the key individuals leave or they're taken over by another firm that might either change the culture or put more pressure on them to grow assets. And if they grow assets, they might no longer be able to add as much value uh, in the mid and small cap area, let's say, as they used to um, because they're too big and would move um, prices. Um, or it could be that um, they just haven't moved on like the rest of the industry in a newer area, like ESG or understanding of climate risk or something like that. So they've, they're no longer uh, a top conviction manager. So that could be one reason. Or it could be as simple as we've just found a new fabulous manager that we'd really love to get into the portfolio. Nothing's changed to any of the others. We might just add them as a new manager or we want, might want to replace one of the others that we still like, but it's gone down a little bit in the conviction list. So that could be another reason. Or it could be that, there's no real reason that we specifically think another manager is better, but two of the managers have ended up looking quite similar in their portfolios. Do we need both of them in the portfolio anymore? Still like them both. Maybe we only need one of them. And it's an opportunity to get another manager in that's bringing something different to the portfolio. And so that's the kind of thinking that we go through um, every day um, when we're in the office thinking about, is this still the best portfolio that we could have in place. If you look at the returns on, on these since you put them in the portfolio, are there sort of any sort of standout winners there or, or laggards? Yeah, so um, I'll, I will answer the question, but an, an important piece of backdrop is that over that full six years, pretty much anyone with a growth bias has done well and pretty much anyone with a value bias has done less well. Um, now, there's obviously nuance uh, within that. And of course, there was a dramatic change in 2022 versus the prior period. And indeed, um, it's come back with growth doing quite well in the, in the first quarter. So need to have that backdrop. But certainly, um, you know, the manager that's probably performed the best over the full period is GQG. Um, and GQG are a bit more rotational uh, in, in what they do now. You know, the clue is in the title of what they do. That's um, global quality growth 
um, is, is their name. So they are looking for quality growth, but their definition of quality growth is all about their view of the quality of cash flows uh, over the next um, few years. And so um, that can move them around um, areas. So if we take GQG, they were, they were in a lot of the large cap tech names um, going through till um, second half of 2021. They actually started to make a rotation then out of um, some of those names into energy, where they saw actually a lot of reasons to believe that the quality of the cash flows from a number of those energy companies was going to be very strong over the course of the next three to five years. And they were a little bit early in that, but generally very successful in making that trade. They ran the growth bias uh, up for quite some time while it was doing incredibly well and then benefited from that rotation out of tech into, uh, into energy. And then more recently, um, they've been um, buying back some of those uh, tech names following some of the falls in their, return, uh, in their prices during 2022. So they've probably the manager that have uh, done the strongest. But then if you just take the last 12 months, the, like of, the likes of Black Creek and Jupiter have done very well, a bit more value oriented um, uh, and, uh, and pretty global and underweight US. Um, those two managers have done, and, and a bit more down the, the mid cap uh, space, those two managers have done particularly well over the last 12 months. Um, Sands Capital, on the other hand, being the most strong growth manager, they only came into the portfolio um, about um, oh, 18 months ago or so. Uh, I may get my timing wrong on that, maybe a little bit before that. Um, so that's been a tough time for growth. Now, they only came in at a very small weighting because growth had done so well over that period and we were putting them in to make sure we'd got the right blend in the portfolio. So we were expecting if growth took a hit that they, they would struggle. And so um, that's not something that concerns us. But you know, if you just looked at the numbers, SANS would look as though they've got probably the worst performance because they just happen to have been uh, in the portfolio since that turn uh, in growth. GQG, though, have been in the full six years and they've got the, the strongest performance of, of the lot. Okay, cool. Um, looking at the Asia weight, um, are you particularly underweight China within that? So China's um, position has changed a bit. We are a little bit underweight uh, China. That, that has changed a fair bit. I mean, for example, GQG, and I, I mentioned they're one that, that move around. They were um, overweight China at one point, um, then, then back to underweight China um, more recently. And so that has moved around a little bit, um, but it's not, a, it's not a big position. Okay, fair enough. Um, and obviously the, the sector weights are just driven by the downline managers. It's probably not worth getting your perspective on things, much as I'm sure it's uh, worth knowing about. Um, you've got this sort of strategy. This, this is the record for Alliance Trust. If we looked at the record for this strategy, that um, going back beyond this, how has it done, say, over 10 years? Yeah, so we've, we've been running um, portfolios in a, in a similar kind of uh, way for about 16, 17 years in the institutional space. Uh, and the performance has been, yeah, very strong. So um, outperforming by, you know, significantly more than 2% per annum over the very long term. Um, but, you know, there are periods within that where it's uh, clearly stronger than others. Unlike um, a lot of single manager approaches where that's more driven by whether the style is in favour or out of favour, with us, it's more driven by um, whether uh, fundamentals are coming through uh, in stock prices, whether you know the index just happens to be having an unbelievable period relative to any randomly selected you know, 100 stock, 200 stock portfolio because it's been driven by a small number of um, concentrated bets in um, uh, in one sector. So, you know, you look at the uh, the market cap index, it's got a very big bias towards a small number of companies in um, US tech. Um, and, you know, over the last six years, uh, that means it's been about the one of the best performing portfolios out there. That's less true if you go back 10 years, 15 years, and hence the performance has been 
much stronger over that longer period. Okay, cool. Um, one specific, uh, specific question here, how much does the um, Hermes ESG overlay cost? Oh, uh, it's very small. You, you wouldn't really even notice it in basis point terms. It's a relatively small cost on that across a, uh, a portfolio uh, of this size. Uh, I can't remember the exact number, but um, very, very small relative to the cost of the underlying stock pickers. Great. OK, thank you. Um, I suppose, I mean, you might think that if we get to a period where uh, fundamentals reassert themselves and those sort of big tech type companies stop dominating indices, you might actually have a much better period. Do you think that's reasonable? Um, definitely think it's true that if fundamentals really drive markets and you have fewer of these big macro events, I mean, it's unusual that you get the, the number we've had, you know, you've, you, you've had COVID um, to start with and, and the various lockdowns that happened as a result of that. You've had the Ukraine war, um, you've had um, inflation um, changes, interest rate rises to, to combat that. Some quite a lot of not to mention some political things going on, um, you know, China tensions, et cetera, et cetera. All of those happening in a relatively small space of time has meant that the market has really been driven by a lot of those. If we get back to, uh, and I hate using the term, but a more normal environment where fundamentals are really what's driving markets, then yes, I think this strategy would perform very well indeed. It's less about whether tech does well or badly. We're not massively underweight the tech names per se uh, we are underweight um, mega cap and large cap which includes some of those but it's more around this fundamentals driving things there's a lot of um, companies in the portfolio that look very attractive producing great uh, earnings uh, beating expectations and that just hasn't yet come through in the share price one last question which came in right at the beginning but i think it's an interesting one um do you think this strategy would work for a global small cap portfolio? I think the, the, the principle of it works very well. The, the interesting thing in small cap is whether small cap is better run by uh, regional specialists. Um, in large and mid cap space, there's a big advantage to knowing uh, the competitors on a global basis and running global portfolios makes a lot of sense. In small cap, um, there's a, a different dynamic. So the, the multi-manager approach and running concentrated portfolios absolutely, I think, would work very, very well in um, small cap. But I think if we put something like this together, you'd get a few more regional specialists running 20 stock portfolios rather than a global small cap, you know, uh, rather than eight, nine, 10 global small cap managers. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you very much, Craig. That's um, very interesting. Um, and um, thanks for the, the catch up. So uh, we'll, we'll nice talk to you again you. another time. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we'll be back next week uh, with uh, JP Morgan Japanese, um, which is the fund you know um, we've written on a few times and we think it's quite interesting. Uh, don't forget, if you haven't signed up already for our property investment conferences coming up, that's on the 18th of May. Um, and otherwise, have a good back holiday weekend. And I'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye bye.